Okay, so how's everybody doing? Good? How was the exam? Easy? Yeah. Was the answer to the first question correct? I have no idea. I don't remember what the first question was. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Uh, so for those questions, it's about order of operations. So whether it comes out as 5.0 or 5, uh, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. If you have space between the operator, it doesn't make any difference to how the code executes. It's uh, it's just about style. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Well, I'll, I have to prepare the answer key today, so I'll look at those again. Um, but otherwise. Seems reasonable exam, not surprising. The sample exam was a good preparation for it. Not reasonable, no. Well, that's okay. So the, the last question is there for. Uh, <coughs> I mean, there have to be questions that only uh, only a small number of people will get. So one question out of twenty-five, I think, is not too much. Uh, so if, if you'd like, I can. Uh, sort of tell you what the last question was was doing. Um, maybe not right now, but some other time. Or you can just look up Monte Carlo estimation on the internet. You'll you'll see what it was. Okay. Um, so now that we've got that behind us, I'm a little uh, a little depressed by attendance today. It seems to be a lot lower than usual. So. That seems to suggest that a bunch of people wrote the midterm and then are coming back. Um, I hope that that's not the case, but because I, I didn't think the midterm was uh, was so hard. Um, okay, so uh, time to move on to the next topic in this course, which is uh, for the next three weeks or so we'll be doing game or simulation or animation development using Pygame. So Pygame is a library for Python that's designed uh, with the idea of making it easier to write video games in Python. And uh, a particular type of video games, so 2D, um, typically sprite-based games. So we won't be doing these complicated 3D graphics. Um, so it'll be two-dimensional stuff, although you can sort of fake two-and-a-half-dimensional. Um, you can do two-and-a-half-dimensional stuff by putting certain images in front of others, but we're not going to try for, you know, full 3D. Um, it's, not, it's not what Pygame is, uh, is for. Um, so a few things about Pygame. It's really a interface onto... Uh, an older library called SDL, which was a library for accessing graphics, um, cross-platform library for accessing graphics, works under Linux, Mac OS, and, uh, and Windows, um, and gives you access to this sort of high-performance uh, graphics subsystem. Um, Okay, so it's, uh, it's the Python version of, of that, and it's, it's reasonably decent. There have been a good number of free games developed with it. Uh, one or two commercial games have, uh, have also been written in, in Pygame. And one of the nice things that I discovered recently is that uh, there is a subset of Pygame which is ported to Android. So that means if you don't do anything too fancy or use anything too weird, you can fairly easily take a Pygame project, so a game that you've written in Pygame, and, uh, and have it run on Android devices like, uh, like this uh, tablet here or your smartphone. Um, so I'll show you an example of that in a, in a second. 
So, uh, and so that means actually you can start this week, write a game, and uh, you know by next week have a game that's in the Android store available for download by uh, by the billions of people who own Android phones. And uh, you know even if only. Uh, one tenth of one percent uh, of those people download your store app and it costs a dollar, well, you'll be $10 million richer by the, the end of next week. So, um, so good luck with that. Um, so, I'll, first I'll show you a couple of examples of, of things developed in, in Pygame. And I didn't know really, I'd never used Pygame up until last week or so. When somebody, uh, another instructor in our department, had it installed on the lab machines so that we could, uh, so that she could use it for teaching her course, and she mentioned it to me, and I had always been meaning to learn about it and think about using it, and so, uh, so I just sat down and did. So over the long weekend, I had a, a bit of free time, um, and I sat down and wrote a couple of games. So. First one was just to, to get my, uh, my feet wet, and it's a game called 3SAT. Um, here's what it looks like. You may be able to hear, here's what it sounds like. Um, so it's a, you know, not just wanting to learn how to use Pygame and not wanting to think too hard about game design, I took a problem that is a famous problem in computer science. Uh, it's called circuit satisfiability. In this case, it's a special version of it um, called 3SAT uh, three or 3CNF three SAT. Uh, and the goal is you have a bunch of switches. They can be turned on or turned off. So they're, uh, they're Boolean variables. And uh, let's try not to solve it. Okay, so you can turn them on or you can turn them off. Um, and when you turn them on, you know, they're a Boolean variable that's set to true. When they're turned off, they're a Boolean variable that's set to false. And then there's all these little, uh, these little hat things. They're actually OR gates. So what they need is one thing going into them that's turned on, and they'll be green. And if there's no green uh, things, no, no on switches turned into them, they'll, they'll be red like this one here. Uh, and now like this one here. And uh, in addition to those, so those things are connected to the, the switches, there's also inverters. So these little triangles here take something that's turned, that's off, that's red, and they make it green, or they take something that is green, and, uh, and they make it red, like this one is doing here. So those are knots. Um, so inverters. And the goal is to make all of these little hats green, so to satisfy the, the circuit. So in this case I didn't succeed. Um, so usually they're pretty easy. The game starts out easily. Usually you just, uh, I'll turn the sound back on so you can, you can hear me winning. So usually the game starts out and the, the circuits are mostly already satisfied. You just have to find a, a couple of inputs that, that finish that. Um, but actually as the game goes on, it start to starts to design these things so that they're more sophisticated, more difficult to satisfy. And it uses a fairly simple heuristic for that. Um, it just generates them at random and then measures what fraction of the, uh, the possible states of these switches actually give a solution. So for here, we have four switches. Uh, that means there's 16 possible different states, and maybe there's two of those that give a solution, or three of those. Eventually, if you play this long enough, the, the number of switches goes up all the way up to eight. So that means there's 256 possible states, and the number of solutions ends up going down to one out of those 256 possible states. Um, and you have 20 seconds to, to find that one solution. So just enumerating them all probably won't, uh, won't cut it. Um, so that was my first attempt. And you do this for a, a while, and uh, you know, 
it's an okay game. It takes a while for it to get challenging, and then it gets challenging real quick, and you die quickly, and then you have to start over. So it could use some some more work on the the difficulty side of it. Um, okay, but you know, it's a fairly full-featured game. It has the notion of levels. It has lives. I have three of them up here. There's a score, which is basically the number of puzzles you've solved multiplied by something, 200, I think. Um, and the, the difficulty increases. There. Now we're up to five, uh, five of these things. That means there's 32 possible states. And they start to get trickier. They, Um, so just a little historical note, this three-sat problem is a very famous problem in computer science. It's one of the first problems that was shown to be uh, NP-hard, and, uh, and essentially what that means, or the way you can think of it, is if you're given a big instance of one of these problems, one that has not five, but, uh, but 50 or 100 or 1,000 different of, of these possible switches, then there seems to be no algorithm for solving these things faster than just trying all the possible combinations. And that's bad because if you have a thousand switches and you need to try all the possible combinations, that means you need to try two to the one thousand combinations and two to the one thousand is a number that looks like this. Um, and that's way more than, for example, the number of atoms in the universe. Um, so. Uh, so this, this is a hard problem, at least when there's a lot of switches. When there's five switches, it's not a hard problem because there's only 32 different things to try. Even when there's eight switches, there's only 256 different things to try. A computer can do that easily, exhaustively, but as the, the number of switches goes up, it gets, uh, it gets more difficult. Okay. Um, all right, so questions or comments or criticisms about that game? So that was my first day of learning how to use Pygame. So it's not terribly, it's not a steep, steep learning curve. Um, a lot of computer graphics libraries, there is a big learning curve. It takes a long time even to just get a window up. But Pygame is, uh, is fairly simple, and it's, uh, it's not a ton of code. Let's see. Uh, 391 lines of code. Um, so that's not a big program by by any measure. Uh, okay, so this one was called. So next, I thought, okay, I have a, a pretty good feel now for how this library works. Uh, maybe I should think a little bit more about the design of the game because, uh, you know, it's 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 great that you know how to implement something masterfully, but if the game is crap, and this one three sat is not that fun of a game. Um, it doesn't matter how well you implement it or how nice it looks, it's still not going to be uh, going to be fun or serve a purpose. And I decided to uh, to focus on a different target audience. Uh, it's an audience of size one, actually. So uh, I have a three-year-old daughter who, when she was very young, uh, probably about 18 months or even less, learned all the letters of the alphabet. And the way she learned them was in the bathtub using a, a set of letters, which was uh, these puffy sort of looking letters. Um, and, you know, by, by playing these, uh, these games with her and associating letters with names of her friends or names of, uh, of different things, she's able to identify all 26 letters of the, the alphabet. So that was a year and a half ago, and I thought, this is fantastic. She already knows her alphabet. She's way ahead. I don't have to... Uh, worry about teaching her anything anymore. Um, until recently, I, you know, would ask her to show him, point out letters or, you know, show her a letter and say, you know, what, what does this start with? And uh, she couldn't tell me. So I'd show her, you know, something that starts with the letter A. I'd say, what letter is that? And she, she couldn't tell me. Um, so I thought she'd forgotten it. So I went back and got those puffy letters from the, the the bathtub letters, and started going through those, and she could identify all those. And then I realized, actually, the problem is that there's just one font that she can identify, and it's this puffy letters that, 
that we have in the, the, the bathtub. And as soon as it's in a different font, it's different now. So, um, so I wanted to make something that helped her work on that. And I thought about the things that she likes and the things that she's interested in. Well, one thing that I know she likes is anything that has a screen. Um, so anything with a backlit display, whether it's a television, a laptop, a tablet, whatever, uh, she likes to play with those things. And indeed, you know, I've let her play before with some of these Android games that I've downloaded, some ones for kids that are really uh, annoying and, uh, and I think pretty bad, and she loves those. So, um, so I thought, well, here's a chance to do something useful with this. Uh, the other thing that she likes uh, a lot is to make bubbles. What kid doesn't, right? You blow, you blow bubbles. So I thought maybe I can combine, combine these, these things into a game. Um, and so I did that. Can you find the and here's the game. It's got a soundtrack. It has pictures of her in the background, which is another thing that she really likes, is to see pictures or movies of herself. And uh, a bunch of bubbles with letters in them floating around and she's asked to identify one, so E. E. And of course the, the things are in different Where's fonts. Where's the letter I? I. And it has in her father's voice in it, work. which of course she uh, Point to the letter Y. Y. Yes, you did it. So if you do this for a while... Point to the letter N. Yeah. And it's controllable. You can add more letters. You can take away letters if things are looking too... Uh, M. Great work. Too complicated. Where, where is the letter B? And you can also have it generate uh, lowercase letters, which of course are really hard because they look, in many cases, nothing like the, the uppercase versions. B. Bravo. Is there a letter G? So now she's looking for that G, but of course it's, uh, it's, it's there. It looks nothing like its, uh, its uppercase version. G. Great. So the, the hope was that this would... This would work um, for her, and of course, one thing she can't do because she just hasn't been exposed to computers that much is use a mouse. So I wanted this on a touchscreen device, and so I needed to uh, to port it to a touchscreen thing, and I decided to use the the Pi game Android version. Um, and the port was fairly easy. There were some issues with sounds that, uh, that didn't, there, you know, there's not perfect sound control or volume control, but porting the game was, uh, it was harder really installing the Android development kit than it was to, uh, to port the game. Um, so there you go. Keep an eye out in the Android store for Alpha Pop, and uh, I'm sure it's going to sell millions. Um, <coughs> Okay, so that's sort of the motivational speech. Um, so that's what I could do given my limited budget of time and, uh, and limited knowledge after about a week of, uh, of looking at this stuff. So without ever having done anything in Pi Game a week, a week before this, and then after a week I was able to make a, a couple of games. So we have about three weeks to do this. And, uh, and so you guys will have a chance to do something, well, as sophisticated as you, uh, as you want it to be. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's start taking a look at, uh, at these Pi game examples. So today is October 21st. So here I have a game written in Pi game. Let's, uh, let's, it's game is in quotes here. Let's play this game. Um, so there it is. The game is running now. It's just a big black window. The object of the game is to 
find the uh, X so that you can close that uh, window. <coughs> um, so there, I just won the game. Um, congratulations to me. Uh, okay, so, so how did this work? So I mean, this is the kind of thing we have to start with. So let's see how this works. So we have this object called, this class called my game, um, and it has this init method. If we look at the end of this uh, program, all we do is create an instance of this class. So that's the whole program. So all the work must happen inside this class. Uh, it calls pygame init. Before that, it, it imports some stuff. Um, what's wrong with this import line here? Bad style. Guido would disapprove. And even the ordering of the imports, Guido would disapprove of. We want the built-in stuff, then the system-dependent stuff, and then any third-party libraries. So there's a, a nicer version of that. Um, and in our init method for this object, which is the first thing that gets called, we call pygame.init. So that initializes the, the pygame module. Then we pick the size of our window, 640 by 480, and we create a what we call a screen by telling Pygame to set the display mode to be this width by this height. Okay. So we end up with a window that is 640 pixels wide by 480 pixels tall, and that's the actual inside of the window. That doesn't count any of the borders or other stuff that's, uh, that's added. We pick a background color and save that. Um, Anybody know what this notation means? Yeah, so it's the RGB notation that tells us how much red, how much green, and how much blue is in this, this color. Uh, these are integers between 0 and 255, um, which means they're 8-bit they're quantities. And in this case, we want, and it's a, this is an additive color model so that um, things add together. So it's not like putting filters in front of a light. It's, uh, it's the opposite. It's like having a red light, a green light, and a blue light, and we can, we can brighten them or, or make them dimmer. In this case, we took the red light and turned it all the way down. We took the green light, turned it all the way down to zero, and we took the, the blue light, turned it all the way down to zero, which means that there's no light at all, so this color is black. If I wanted white, I would crank all three colors up to their maximum value, 255, uh, and that would give me pure white. <coughs> okay. Um, then, well, I'll show you this bit in a second. Um, we, we set a timer. We'll see what that does in a second. And then we call this thing called the event loop. And this event loop is a loop that runs forever. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of graphics programs work like this. They're what's called event-driven. Um, and if you think about it, most of the time, computers, especially desktop computers, aren't really doing anything, right? So they're sitting there, and uh, like right now, for example, this computer is sitting here displaying its display and essentially waiting for me to, uh, to push a button or to, uh, to do something um, and, uh, and not doing anything. So windowed programs do this kind of thing and rather than sit there in a tight, tight loop saying, okay, is somebody doing something? Is somebody pressing a key? Is somebody... Uh, like, you know, like one of these annoying cartoon dogs from, uh, from these old Disney cartoons asking, okay, are you ready? Or should we do something? Should we do something? It just calls some function to give up control and says, just wait. I'm going to give control to something else, the operating system or something, and say, just wait for something to happen. Wait for something that I have to respond to. And when that happens, give me back, tell me what happened. Give me back this, this event. And this one handles two kinds of events. One is the quit event, and that event gets generated when somebody clicks on the, uh, 
on the X to close a window or press, presses Alt F4 or does whatever your windowing system does to, to close windows, calls the quit event, in which case we exit. Um, or there's another event called the refresh event, which happens when it's time to update the display. And in that case, we call self.draw. And if we look at self.draw, it fills the screen with a background color. Okay, so there's a couple, of, uh, a couple of things here. So when does this refresh event get called? Well, that's what we did up here. We set what's called a timer to send us this refresh event. And we asked it to send us this refresh event. You specify the time in milliseconds, or how frequently you want to receive it. Yep. That's fine, um, because you don't define it after you call it, because this code here, uh, event loop, is not called until you call uh, init, right? It's called right here, so it's called by init. And init is not called until you create an instance of this class. And now, uh, where do I create an instance of this class? down here at the end after everything about that class is defined. Okay. So there's no, no problem there. Yep? Um, do you need such an event? I mean, you can, you can do it some other way. I mean, you can have it quit when the user presses escape or something, but... Uh, I think, I mean, sys.exit will quit the entire program, so that, that will close things. But if you had, you know, other stuff to do here, you could. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, this is taken from, uh, using sys.exit is taken from the example that comes with Pygame, so... Uh, so that's why I use it. Maybe pygame.quit is, uh, is another alternative. But yep. Okay, maybe. Okay, so it shouldn't, yeah. I mean, there shouldn't be a response problem if you're using, uh, if you're processing events, but maybe. Um, okay. So, yeah, so two things. Um, one thing we do here is we set a timer. So a timer is like an alarm clock. It, uh, it sets off an alarm every once in a while. You specify how, how frequently you want this, and you specify that in milliseconds. So I want this in 1,000 milliseconds, which is one second, divided by this number FPS for frames per second, and this, I set it to 30 here. So basically, I want 30 times per second, I want this, this uh, timer to go off. And when this timer goes off, it generates a self.refresh event, and that's what we handle here. Okay? And this is a fairly typical thing to see in a video game or an animation, is a timer that uh, says, goes off and says, refresh, show me the next frame in the animation or the next frame in the, the video game, and a refresh rate of 30 frames per second is about, uh, it's about the minimum you should shoot for for a nice looking game. Um, six, I mean, many of them go up to 60 frames per second now, uh, but 30 frames per second is, is about the minimum you should shoot for. Less than that, and it becomes, uh, it becomes quite, uh, animations start to look a little, little choppy. Um, so this, this event gets called every, uh, every 33 milliseconds or so, 33 and a third milliseconds, and, uh, and it tells us to, to refresh the display, okay? Um, 
And so that ends up calling draw 33 or 30 times per second. Um, and then this draw thing does something interesting. It fills the screen with a black color and then does this weird thing called uh, that's Pi Game Display Flip. Now, uh, to understand what that does, the way to think of it is as a, think of the display as a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard or even better, a chalkboard that has two sides. So one side of this paper is facing you right now and you're looking at this, this is what you're seeing is the writing on this side of the paper. Now when I want to draw this thing, so I want to do an animation or something nice looking and that means I'll have to draw the different parts of the animation. For example, I'll have to draw the bubbles one at a time or and I'll have to draw the background and, and various things. And I don't want to see, let you see that when it's only half drawn. So if I'm doing this bubble game and there's four bubbles on screen, I don't want to let you see a frame where you only see two bubbles or you see the bubbles come one, two, three, four. I don't want you to see anything until it's all ready to show you. So I draw on the back side of this paper. So and this is called a double buffer. So I'm drawing on a buffer that's not actually what's being displayed right now. So I draw this stuff here, I draw the bubbles, I, I do all this great artwork back here. And then when it's all ready and everything is perfect, then in one instant I call flip. And what you see, so this happens, you know, between screen refreshes, I flip this thing and suddenly the whole picture appears on, in front of you. You get to see the whole thing. Now I have the back side of this paper that I'll start using to draw my next picture. I'll erase it. That's what happens here when you fill the screen. I'll erase whatever's on there and start drawing the next picture. When that's ready, I'll flip it again. So, um, so a very common source of, of programming errors is to forget to call flip and then nothing seems to work because all you're doing is drawing on the back side of this thing and then you're never showing it to the user so, so nobody ever gets to see what you've drawn. Or you call flip because you learned that at the beginning that you're supposed to call it, but at some point you're furiously writing code, you get excited because you're going to start drawing the parts of your, your thing, and you say, okay, now I've got the screen color blank, and I drew some of my picture, okay, now it's time to start drawing some more, um, and then, you know, draw some stuff, like this, and uh, good, you run it, and your stuff's not, not appearing. And the reason it's not appearing is, well, if you look at what happens here, uh, you drew some stuff after you flipped the screen. And so, so your, your code might be working perfectly, it might be drawing the stuff perfectly, but, uh, but you know, look, look at what happens. The screen gets filled black, you draw a little bit, and then you flip it, and now I draw some stuff, and before I flip it again, the screen is going to get filled black. So the stuff that I just drew is just going to get wiped off and then, and then flipped. So everything that you want to draw for updating a frame goes before the display flip. And in fact, a nice way to, uh, to ensure that is to actually do it. Leave that out of the draw method and put it there. Okay. So... <clears throat> Any questions about that so far? No. Seems easy, right? Straightforward. And I hope it's easy because uh, if it's not easy to display a, a window with nothing but a black background, we're in trouble. Um, right? So there's a good, a good measure of a you know, gaming library is how much code it takes to display an empty window. And in some cases, it's a highly non-trivial amount of, uh, of code. Here, it's not so bad at all. If we didn't care about objects and we didn't care about being a little bit, you know, breaking things up into functions, it wouldn't be much, uh, much work at all. Um, and it's still not, not much work. <coughs> all right. So now let's, uh, let's draw something. And I guess if we're going to draw something, we need something to draw. Now, Pygame has a whole library of drawing functions 
which I rarely recommend using. So for example, we can uh, say pygame.draw circle. You can look up the documentation for that. So there's the draw library, draw a circle. So we need to specify what's called a surface. Um, almost everything in Pygame ends up being a surface. Uh, in particular, that screen with the two sides that I was talking about, that's a surface. So we can draw on that surface. Um, it's called self.screen in our program. So we need a surface, a color, a position, a radius, and a width, and an optional width. So we need a surface, which will be self.screen. We need a color, um, and let's try red. We need a position, so let's try position 100, 100. And we need a width, which was optional, so let's leave that out and see what happens. circle function in the draw module. Takes at least four arguments. Screen, color, position, ah, radius, was it? Screen, color, position, radius. We forgot the radius. And let's do a radius of 10. So there we've drawn a circle. <coughs> um, all right, so that seems to work, and it's a red circle, and it's at position 100, 100. So let's see what that really means. Um, so we can, to figure out what that means, we can change its position. Let's put it at maybe 200 or 400, 100. So when I draw it at 400, 100, it moves off to the right here. So that tells us that this coordinates here, uh, if we're thinking about x coordinates or first coordinates, they start at zero over here on the left side of the display and they increase as we move to the right. And in this case, they go from zero up to 640 because we have, or 639 because we have a, a 640. Uh, pixel wide screen. Now, now we can play with the y coordinates. Let's make that be uh, also 400. So that makes it move down. And this is one of the uh, it's not particularly frustrating after the first little, uh, first few attempts, but in computer graphics, it's almost always the case that the coordinate system starts with 0, 0 up in the top left corner. If you increase the X coordinates, you go off to the right. And if you increase the Y coordinates, you go down. And that can be a little confusing if you've been studying Cartesian coordinates in math in high school because in most math y coordinates increase upwards when we draw them. Um, it's exactly the opposite for, for computer graphics. Uh, the y coordinates, if you increase them, that means you're, you're going downwards. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so there, we, can, uh, we know how to draw a circle. And lots of things you can draw, line segments, ellipses, polygons, uh, whatever you, you want. But if you want to make nice looking games, I recommend you that you will hardly ever use this at all. And more likely what you want to do is go to Google's advanced image search. And you want the advanced image search because you want to be able to specify some, some criteria. Um, so we're looking for, I don't know, we'd like to draw an image and I don't know. Give me something to search for. 
Dog. We did a cat last class, so let's do a dog this class. And you can specify things like the size. Um, so I don't want large images particularly. Uh, so I don't know, maybe medium. You can try that. Uh, but there's two things that I, I'm really interested in. One is the usage rights. So I don't want to take somebody's image who has a strong copyright on it and is like greedy and says, don't use my image, it's my image, don't, don't even look at it. Um, take something that's free to use or share. Okay? And when you find the image, take a, you know, go to the page and check the actual license that, that it's distributed under. The most common will be something like a Creative Commons Share Alike license uh, or, a, or, or an attribution license, a Creative Commons Buy license. Um, share Alike just means that, well, if you share it, you should let everyone else share it too, uh, along with anything else. And an attribution license just means that you should tell somebody where you got that image from. So if it came from a... a you know, from someone's Flickr account, then, you know, in your code or if you're going to really release a program in your program, you should, uh, you should have a credit somewhere for, for that person. Uh, okay, so one thing is the license. That we want something that's free to use or share. And, uh, sorry, not the, the type. I don't care so much about that. Although you can specify that you would like clip art or line drawings. Um, that could be helpful. But what you really want is something with transparency. So, uh, so image transparency is, well, this property that, so images are always these rectangles, these big rectangular blocks of some shape, right? If you look at the, the, the sizes that you can ask for, they're all listed in terms of these rectangles. Um, and, uh, and so that's annoying because most things you want to draw are not rectangles. And so what you would like is images that, you know, have a picture on them that's the picture you want to draw, and then the rest of that rectangle should be see-through, like a piece of glass. And that's what transparency does. So an image with transparency means that there are some parts of the image that are see-through, and that's usually a good indicator that it's really a picture of something, and then the rest is, uh, is transparent. So let's... Uh, We'll leave that. Let's search for dogs that are transparent and shareable. Free to use and, uh, and reuse. So, um, so there's some nice pictures of dogs. I don't know. Which one should we use? Rottweiler? Okay. And if we visit this page... We'll leave it. We'll hope that its, uh, <coughs> its license is generous enough. Don't do that. Um, don't take shortcuts like that, but I will today. Um, so do as I say, not as I do. Oh, how big is he? He's pretty big. Uh, well, we'll save him anyway. She, you yeah, know, good point. <coughs> good observation. Uh, <laughs> So we'll save her, but she's a bit too big. So we'll scale her. So, uh, images are really easy to, to draw. You say pygame.image.load, specify the file name, in this case it's dog.png. That gives me an image. 
Now, I need to know how big this image is. So, and an image is again just another surface. It's another one of these rectangular blocks of, of picture. I want to know how big this thing is. So I say image.get rectangle. And it's not so much that I care how big it is, but actually, <clears throat> when I draw an image, which is done using uh, a function called lit, um, I need to specify, it's not pi game, uh, so I want to draw something on screen, so I use a function called blit, which takes an argument, which is a surface, in this case it's the image that I just created, that it's going to draw, and uh, it takes a second argument, which is a rectangle, which says where to draw this thing. So in this case, I'll use the rectangle that came with the, the image. So let's try that. And of course, it's not screen, it is self.screen. So there's our Rottweiler drawn up, up here. And notice uh, it's, nice, uh, it's nicely uh, drawn, nicely transparent where it should be. Uh, we used a, a black background, but we could switch that very easily to a, uh, a green background. and the, the dog looks fine. So the dog is a rectangle, the image is a rectangle, but some of it is transparent, so it just takes on the, the background color in those, those places. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see. Why is the dog in the, the upper left corner? So to know that, we need to know what this rectangle is. So this rectangle, if when we print it, it shows us as 0, 0, 150, 101. And so this is the left, this is the top, this is the right, and this is the bottom. And we got that rectangle from the image, so it's just telling us how big the image is. So it's always going to be 0, 0, um, and then the, the, the right and bottom is just the height and, uh, and width of the the image or the width and height of the image. So if we want to draw that somewhere else, um, then we want to move that rectangle. So we call rectangle.move will give us a new rectangle which has been translated by a certain x amount and a certain y amount. And maybe we'd like to uh, draw this image, let's say, in the center of our screen. So how would we do that? or maybe centered at the bottom, I don't know. So it doesn't look like he's floating, maybe it looks like he's, he's standing there. So, I want to move it to some position x, y. So how would I get it to be in the center of the screen? Yep. Okay, so we've stored the width and height of the screen in these variables width and height. And so we'll take this rectangle and we'll move it uh, to that location. Yep? Um, didn't, didn't you set up uh, at the beginning get height or get width in the other program? Or there was height? When I created this window, I... Uh, I save the width and the height and use those. So, uh, yes, you can set Pygame to when you just use the display. You can uh, take some different arguments, which are flags, and one of those flags is full screen. Um, be wary of, be careful of that, because if we do that here, for example, if we go full screen, there's no way to close the window except by pressing the X button. And if we're full screen, you won't see the X button. So you'll be stuck. Um, can you, can you, alt -tab into the you can probably alt-tab into the terminal and kill it, but it's not a good, 
It's not a good interface. So you'd want another way to uh, to get out of it. Yep. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's see what happens when we do this. So there's the dog, and he's not quite centered, right? But he's drawn at position exactly width and height, or half the width and half the height. That's about that point right there where the cursor is. And yeah, that's about the top left corner of the image. So we don't really want the top left corner centered. We want somehow the center. We want this thing to be over there. And so... To do that, we take, uh, we subtract the rectangle's width from the self-width. Or we subtract, we take that point and we subtract half the width of the dog image and half the height. Now he really is centered, and uh, he looks like he's going to chase that ball. <clears throat> okay, so one thing that uh, you can't see yet because we don't have any real interaction, but uh, if we do this this way, things are going to get a little bit choppy. So remember, we're trying to draw this thing 33 times per second. And that means we have 33 milliseconds to get our image drawn. And, well, uh, that means this draw function should be as efficient as we can make it and shouldn't repeatedly do things which it's already done before. And it particularly shouldn't do things that are slow, which it's already done before. And something which takes a while is loading an image. Um, it takes a while because, well, it has to go and retrieve the image from the disk. Um, you don't know about image formats, but images, image formats are designed to compress the image and make them small on disk, which means that the whole thing has to be uncompressed to get all its pixels and then put into a, put into a surface, and then it's ready to, uh, to display. And so we don't want to... Uh, we don't need to do that every time, right? It's only one image of a dog. It's the same image every frame. So we can, rather than load it here in the draw method, we can load it at the beginning when we initialize. And this is a fairly common pattern is in the initialization function or the initialization code, there's a bunch of resources like images, sounds, various things that are on disk that need to be loaded, decoded, and made ready. Um, and you do those at the beginning of your, your program. So we'll say self dot dog image is that. Dog image, dog image. So avoid loading things in your draw function. Remember all the time that this draw function gets called 33 times per second. Okay. So um, what should we do next? Yep. Make the dog chase the ball. Okay. Um, Okay, so the ball's not moving. We know where it is. Uh, so we can probably figure, figure out how to do that. And so we'd like the dog to chase the ball, or at least go to the, the position of the, the ball. The ball is at position 400, 400. The dog starts somewhere. Okay, so seems like if we want to make the dog chase the ball, We'll want to keep track of the dog's position. And so let's save the dog's position and say
That'll be the dog's position. Okay, um, so that shouldn't have changed anything yet. We just, you know. So we just fixed the position earlier. Um, again, that would be even good for speeding up the draw loop. It means one less calculation that we're, we're doing, um, but it was not a terribly big calculation anyway. And now we'd like to make the dog move towards the ball and keep things modular. that. Um, okay, so how would we make the dog move towards the ball? Yep. Uh, so you're trying to get his mouth onto the ball? Let's just worry about getting the dog there. We can do some adjustments, uh, adjustments later. Um, but, uh, well, okay. Well, I mean, we can figure out wherever we think his mouth is. We'll, we'll maybe try and get that later. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we would like to get the dog over to where this ball is. So we'd like the dog's position to be the, the ball's position. And so maybe every time we redraw, the dog should get a little bit closer to the, the ball. And so let's, uh, after we draw this thing, maybe after we're done everything, we'll, we'll mess around with the, the position of the dog a bit. So... Uh, Let's do Okay, so what have I done here? I've defined another point, or it's actually a vector, that gives me the difference in the x-coordinates between the ball's position and the dog's position, and the difference in the y-coordinates. So, for example, if I take the dog right now and say... Uh, Zero, self dot dog position at one plus equals v at one. Then what's going to happen? So I have a vector. You should think of it as an arrow that points from the ball to the dog. The sorry, the dog to the ball. And now if I add that to the dog's position, what happens? Well, let's find out. Of course.
Where did I do an item assignment? Okay, so now suddenly the dog is down there. So what happened is, and you may or may not see it, you probably don't see it, we drew one frame with the dog up here, and then the dog's position moved immediately to that. Okay. So we don't really want that to, uh, to happen that quickly, right? We'd like this to, to be a little, little slower. Um, so let's say we would like it to take two seconds for the dog to get there. So how could we slow this down? So two seconds means there'll be 60 frames. So right now the dog is going there in one frame. So how could we slow that down to something more reasonable? Yep. Divide V by 60. So we have this vector. If we add it, it'll take us straight there. So what we should do is only add 1 60th of it, and that'll take us 1 60th of the way. When that happens 60 times, we'll get there all the way. And it'll happen 60 times in 2 seconds. Okay, so take V equals V at 0 divided by 60. V at 1 divided by 60. Now this is a little bit risky, but I think it'll be okay in this case, maybe. Um, let's try that. There he goes. The dog moves, moves to the ball. Not exactly the same location. And the reason is, well, we're doing this integer division here, and at some point the dog is within 60 pixels of his destination, his x-coordinate and his y-coordinate is within 60, which means that when you divide by 60, you get zero. So, um, so a better way to do this is to actually keep the dog's position as a, as a floating point. So we'll do this. We'll do real division by 60. Um, so that'll work fine. Let's make sure we're using real division. And the only difficulty then is Pygame doesn't like us translating things or doing things by uh, non-integers, so we may have to fix that. There he moves to the, the location of the ball, but he's putting his top left, uh, left corner on there. So if we wanted to do that a little bit better, um, I don't know, where do we guess his mouth is? Somewhere about uh, near the top right, but a little bit down. So let's, let's try and, uh, and sort that out. Zero. So minus. Close, but not quite. Still not quite there. All right, good job, Rover. <coughs> um, okay, so 
So a lot of, you know, computer graphics and animation is, uh, this will be disappointing to some of you or, or saddening to some of you, is a lot of solving these kinds of math problems. And in particular, linear algebra plays a big role in computer graphics and animation. So, um, you know, when you're sitting in your linear algebra course this year, saying, oh God, why are we learning about these matrices and why do we have to know about these vectors and things? Well, if you ever want to do anything like computer graphics or animation, that's why you have to learn these things. Um, right? It's, it's constantly solving these kinds of puzzles. What is the vector that takes me from here to here? Or what is the rotation matrix that does this to, the, to this thing? Um, and so, so yeah, there's there is math in computer graphics, uh, and there's no, no way around it. If you want to do anything interesting at all, you, you have to learn a, a bit of math. Okay, so now the dog goes after the ball. What, uh, what else? What's our next goal? What's that? He farts? He barks, okay. Uh, okay. Um... All right, so he gets there, and he... So, like images, you can, there are places to go to find free, usable sounds. Dog barking, that looks like a good one. Unfortunately, this one may require a login, and I don't think I have a, a login on this site. Um, Uh, yeah. If we don't get one in the next 60 seconds, we'll, we'll wait. We'll do that in some later class. Yeah, this looks like a, a useless site. Well, let's try it. Okay, so when he gets to his position, then, uh, then maybe he should play that sound. So, sound comes in a file, it's something we want to load. play sounds, you actually want to initialize something called the mixer. And so we've got the sound, and now when do we play it? Yeah, so when the dog reaches the ball, we should, uh, we should play this, uh, this sound. So let's think about this for a bit. So when has the dog reached the ball? When its coordinates are the same as those of the, the ball or 
sort of equivalently when this vector is zero. So maybe when we're within one pixel, because this vector is a real number. Um, so maybe if we say if int v at zero equals zero and int v at one equals zero. So that means that vector is zero in both components, or less than one in both components, then it's time to play that sound. Um, now is this, is this what we want? Looks right. Seems like a lot of distortion there. You know why? Because it's playing that sound 30 times a second. So we're getting this reverb effect. Um, and it's not really 30 times a second because there's a limitation on the maximum number of sounds you can play. It's either 8, 4, or 8 at any given time. So it plays it four times, offset by 30, 33 milliseconds. So you get this weird, this weird reverb. So we need to control this a little bit better. We, we just want to play it once when, when he gets there, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we can organize that how we want, but uh, uh, let's say self dot dog has ball. We'll say that that's false. And then say, so if the vector is zero in both components and self.dog has ball equals false, then we'll play that sound and so that we don't play it again, We'll say self dog has ball equals true. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. There you go. Um, so there, there we have it. The the dog reaches the ball and uh, and it works. Um, okay. What, uh, what next? It's not a very exciting thing. Uh, something we could do to keep this going for a while that's fairly cheap is to take the ball away once he gets there, right? Um, that's always fun. Uh, so we could, for example, say self.ball position is equal to random.range Width, self dot height. And then actually, we may not even need to do this this thing. So as long as we take it away as soon as he gets to it, and next time he won't. Uh, And we need to import random. What's that? The if statement. This one here? Uh, we've still got that declared up top, but yeah, we should clean it. To clean it up. We should take it away. Rage, random dot rage. One more typo, and I'm going to have a random dot rage in a second. Um, comma. Okay. So gets there. Ah. 
its RAND range. And then we take it away. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. Yeah. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. So not the There's slickest. No uh, so not the slickest of uh, of animations, but uh, yeah. I mean, we we didn't spend a lot of effort, and this was done on the fly. Um, so there you, you have some flavor, how to draw things, how to play sounds, and how to do these sort of calculations that get you, uh, get you moving towards this, uh, this thing. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll leave it at there for, for today.